Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen. My name is Omar Ahmed. I'm a fifth year medical student and today I'm happy to give you a session on uh, neuropharmacology. So today we'll be discussing four topics that you've taken recently, opioids, medication for migraines, anesthetics, and sedative hypnotics. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to dive into the questions immediately. I'll let you read the question. And then uh, when I see some uh, answers in the chat, then I'll, I'll start explaining the questions. But before we go on to the questions, I want to give you some tips on how I approach questions. So I've been doing this since uh, second year, so three years. Since three years, I've been doing this in most of my exams, even in the board exams, and I think it's very helpful. I like to read the last sentence of the question first. Why I like doing that is because it tells me what the question is going to be about. Okay, for you guys, for example, you're in your neuro midterm or final, you read the last question, which is telling you the main idea of what they want you to answer based on it's going to narrow your, your your mindset down into whether it's physiology, anatomy, pharmacology, you know, uh, physiology, whatever it is. So you're going to be able to narrow that down at least. Number two, which is more important, is that, for example, if they tell you what is the method of action of this certain drug in the, in the end of the question, and then they give you a whole scenario, you don't really need to know, understand the whole scenario just to answer what that method of action of the drug is. You just need to know the drug, right? Well, this, this, this is just an example, of course. I would still recommend you to go back and read the question uh, after reading the last line. But let's see how that tip helps us with the, with these questions I'm going to give you. So here's the first question. You can read it, the one person in chat. And then when you answer, I'll start explaining. Okay, so someone says B, and that's uh, the incorrect answer. You're close though, but let, allow me to explain to you the answer. So the answer, so basically, what what is the the question here? The scenario, the scenario is of a person, of a patient with pain. Okay, breast cancer, back pain, and then the end. Like I told you, you read the end first. It says, if you can see my mouse, started on oral morphine therapy. Which of the following is the most likely direct effect of this medication on the spinal cord neurons? So we just need to know that she was given morphine and we need to know the method of action of the morphine. So now what is morphine? Morphine is a pain drug uh, and decreases pain. Now I want to give you the um, physiology behind how these drugs decrease pain. Not only this, but also like anti-seizure drugs, how they do their method of action. It's basically in the end, what they want to do is decrease the impulses that come out of a cell, you know? Um, to do that, they need to, they need to make the cell more negative. If you remember from physiology, how a cell can be positive or negative, the membrane potentials. So the more you make it negative, the less it's going to be active, right? So that's the main idea of what we want to do with these medications, seizure medications, morphine, pain medications. To decrease the impulses, we need to make it more negative. So let's look at the choices of whether they make it negative or not. Now, A, activation of sodium, calcium. We both know sodium and calcium are positive anions. So if you're going to bring either sodium or calcium into the cell, it's going to make it more negative and there's going to be more uh, active potentials. So that's why I'm going to be incorrect. Blockage of voltage-dependent sodium influx. Now, in terms of my theory, my explanation, that could be a correct answer as it's making it less neg it's making it more negative because you're decreasing sodium influx. However, for morphine specifically, this is not the method of action of morphine. This is actually the method of action of seizure drugs, anti-seizure drugs, which you will take later on. Now, C, increased calcium influx. Uh, like I told you, calcium is positive. So if you bring more calcium into the cell, it's going to be more positive. So that's not going to help with pain. Increased chloride influx into the cells. That makes sense as well. That chloride is a negative anion. So if it goes inside the cell, it's going to be more negative, and then you're going to have less action potentials. However, similar to B, uh, this is not the method of action of morphine. This is actually the method of action of uh, something we're going to take later on in this session, which is benzodiazepines and barbiturates. So just keep that in mind. So when we cross out A, B, C, D, we're left with E, increased potassium efflux. So that means you're kicking out potassium out of the cell. And if you kick out potassium from the cell, it's going to be more negative. There's going to be less action potentials. And that is the correct answer for morphine. Uh, 
So here's a slide from here's a slide from Doctor. Um, uh, forgot his name. Sorry, uh, the pharmacology lecture. Um, so make sure you remember that there's a difference between the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron. Okay, in the terms of method of action of opioids, in the presynaptic terminal there's less calcium influx, so it becomes more negative. But in the postsynaptic neuron there's actually potassium efflux. So the way they make it more negative is slightly different. And just remember the difference between it being presynaptic and postsynaptic. Okay. So let's move on to the next question. So, oh, sorry. Well, how do you go back? Okay. Okay, here. That's the next question. Okay, so I think that's enough time. So let's go on to the question. Let's read the last sentence. What does it say? Which of the following most likely accounts for the patient's current clinical deterioration? Okay, so the patient's going through something and they want us to know the what's going on with them. So let's read the question. A five-year-old boy, emergency department, accidental drug ingestion. His mother says the patient was playing by himself earlier today and two hours later, she found him unresponsive. There was an empty bottle of hydrocodone uh, acetaminophen. So hydrocodone is an opioid, acetaminophen, painkiller. It can be a drug ingestion of either one of these. We need to figure out which one is which. And so we can give their antidote or whatever. She does not know how many pills. The emergency medical team found the patient stupors, which is like a comatose patient. Bradypnea, which is the opposite of tachypnea, means decreased respiration. So less than 12 respiratory rates per minute. And from just from bedipnia, I'm, I'm going more with hydrocodone because one of the opioid intoxication is a uh, lower respiratory rate. His mental status and respiration promptly improved after one dose of intravenous naloxone. The fact that it improved after naloxone proves our point that it was an opioid overdose and he was transported to the hospital. On arrival, the patient is sleepy, but arouses easily to voice and follows exam instructions. Okay, so one hour later, he has worsening lethargy, bradypnea, and meiosis. So basically, the patient came with an opioid overdose. From you can know that from his his superness, superus, and that and he has low respiratory rates. He was given naloxone and he improved. Naloxone is the antidote to opioid intoxication. But however, one hour later, he worsened and he went back into opioid intoxication, especially from meiosis. Meiosis and low respiratory rate is typical. For opioid overdose, if you see these two, it's 100% opioid overdose, at least in the questions you guys are taking, okay? Uh, and if you remember, meiosis means constricted, so small pupil. If you are forgetting the difference between meiosis and midriasis, remember that meiosis is a smaller word, so it means the pupil is smaller. Midriasis is a bigger word, so it means the pupil is bigger. Now, why did this patient go back into ox uh, intoxication? Because the answer is C. Naloxone has a very short half life. What that means is that you keep on need to give you keep you need to give naloxone uh, over and over again because of its short half life. So the fact that one hour later it became worse because it means that his naloxone um, um, it wore off. Okay, so that's the answer to this question. So this is the other slide from remember that naloxone is the uh, antagonist and that. Um, it's rapid and short acting. Remember that as well. Uh, so that's the main point of our this question. Okay, remember, if a patient comes with opioid intoxication, you want to give them naloxone. Now let's move on to the next question. Okay, so I see someone saying A, that is uh, the incorrect answer. So let's see 
uh, what the right answer is. Now let's go on. Let's see the patient was most likely given which of the following opioid drugs. Okay, that's the question. So a, a man is admitted with burning wounds who's probably going to have pain. And was he was given opioids. Okay. Shortly after the patient develops diarrhea, abdominal pain, and his pupils have become enlarged. On further questioning, the patient reports that he has been smoking opium at home to help him deal with depression and pain. So what is the patient currently having? His pupils are enlarged. Can we say that he has opioid intoxication? No, because opioid intoxication leads to smaller pupils, remember? Instead, opioid overdose, uh, sorry, opioid withdrawals leads to the opposite symptoms of intoxication. So you're going to have enlarged pupil and you're going to have diarrhea. For example, if you know that opioid causes uh, opioid cons causes constipation, when you withdraw from it, it's going to cause the opposite thing, which is diarrhea. Okay, so that's another symptom. And he, and we know that this patient is taking opi opioids. So, so why were the patient that's already taking opioids worsen when he is given opioid therapy? Shouldn't it be the opposite? Shouldn't he feel better? That maybe means that uh, he was given something that's antagonizing receptors and make him go into withdrawals, right? So someone said it's D and that is the correct answer. Now, why is it D? Let's see why it's not A, B, or C. A, B, and C are all direct mu antagonists or kappa antagonists only. So if these, if these were given, the patient would not be presenting with withdrawal symptoms. They'd be feel they'd feel better and everything would go back to normal. But pentazosine, as you will see in this slide, it's a mix, mixed agonist antagonist. It's an agonist at K kappa receptors, but at mu receptors, it's an antagonist. So what that means is if a patient has is, is taking opioids and you give him an antagonist, you're gonna make him go into withdrawal symptoms. Makes sense, right? It's like someone smoking nicotine, they stop smoking nicotine, they're going to get withdrawals. Same thing here. So that's why the slide, it says here, this is from the lecture, pentazosine induces withdrawal symptoms in patients already on morphine, okay? So remember this question, remember this point, okay? Uh, that's why if a patient is not naive to opioids and has, has a history of opioid therapy, you do not want to give pentazosine because you can lead to uh, withdrawal symptoms. And this is the withdrawal symptoms that can occur. Uh, it resembles a viral illness. It's one of the easier ones to recognize. It's not dangerous. It's not, it doesn't lead to any mortality or morbidity. It's just annoying, okay? So the syndrome is characterized by rhinorrhea, sneezing, yawning, yawning, like which type of drug withdrawal leads to yawning, you know? Lacrimation, uh, like I said, cramping, uh, vomiting and diarrhea, um, and most importantly, enlarged pupils. Remember the midriasis, okay? Um, so, so now let me just give you a quick summary of what we just said. So remember that opioids can be used in pulmonary edema, but not other pulmonary issues. You know, like doctors would like to ask you questions based on some things that are like outliers, you know, it's not very easy things, uh, that to memorize some things they can make you focus on. So these, this is one thing, for example, tolerance does not develop. You know what tolerance means? It means over time when you're taking opioids, you let's say I have, uh, let's say a patient has cancer, uh, back, they have a lot of back pain, they're taking opioids for months. Eventually those opioids are not going to work as well for their pain because they've developed tolerance to that medication. Okay. So, but you need to remember that tolerance does not develop to constipation and meiosis. No matter how much uh, opioids you take, later on you will still have uh, constipation and meiosis. That's one important thing to remember. And then withdrawal symptoms are treated with methadone or buprenorphine, okay? So why is that important to know? For example, if a patient comes, he's a he's an opioid addict, okay? He wants to stop, but if he stops, he gets withdrawal symptoms. So how do you treat him? You give him methadone or buprenorphine. So that's it for opioids. Does anyone have any questions before I move on to the next part, anesthetics? So just remember, like I said, the method of action, making it more negative, um, short life of lanoxone and it's being the, anti the, the, um, the antidote, and then pentazosine being a mixed agonist antagonist, okay? Uh, am I too fast? If anyone, If I'm too fast, please someone let me know. Um, pentazosine 
Uh, no, it's not. It's not really used commonly for withdrawal symptoms. The most common ones are used methadone and buprenorphine. That's all you need to know. Whether pentazosine is used or not, uh, it's not as is as much as used as as these two drugs. Yes. So let's move on to anesthetics. It's the next um part. Yes. Okay. So I keep missing the question. Okay. So this is the first question. Go ahead. Hmm. Okay, let's go on with the question. So it says Let's read the last line. It says, prior to enter in the tracheal intubation, intravenous ketamine is administered for induction of anesthesia. Which of the following characteristics is the most likely use, a reason for the use of this anesthetic agent? So now you read the last question. You know what they want from the from the question. So now let's read the whole question. Four-year-old man, shortness of breath. Okay, upper respiratory. He had an upper respiratory week. And now, and he has a history of asthma. Remember that he has a history of asthma, okay? Um. And he uses bronchodilators. Uh, over the past few days, he has had worsening breathlessness, productive cough, and high fever. The patient has no other medical conditions. All his uh, vitals are abnormal. On physical examination, the, peer, the patient appears in severe respiratory stress with intercostal attractions. And here it's revealed that he wants that he has bilateral wheezing. So they want to intubate this patient. So they're giving him intravenous ketamine. Now, why are they giving him intravenous ketamine? Okay. You don't even need to know what's going on with this patient for you to answer this question. So let's see if which answer is right, which answer is wrong, okay? A, is A right? Direct GABA agonism. That's wrong. Why? Because ketamine works at the NMDA receptors. Lower lipid solubility, that's also wrong. Ketamine has high lipid solubility. C, metabolism by plasma enzymes. That's wrong because the only anesthetic or slash new, um, uh, muscle blockade uh, drug that is metabolized by plasma enzymes is succinylcholine. Remember that, okay? Succinylcholine is the only drug that's metabolized by plasma enzymes in terms of this class, okay? Neuromuscular blockade effect, like I told you, it does not work at the neuromuscular, neuromuscular junction. It works at NMDA receptors. So what you're left is, with is AE. Now, why is E something good in this, uh, in this scenario? Okay, so you, this is the Oh, this is the um, slide from Dr. Hatouf's lecture, okay? Uh, it's beneficial for patients who have cardiogenic shock as well as asthmatic. See, the patient was, remember, he, has, he had asthma here. Now, why is it good? Because it stimulates central sympathetic outflow. Now, when you stimulate sympathetic outflow, if you remember from POD that the lungs, the bronchioles have beta-2 receptors, and beta-2 receptors, when you activate them through sympathetic outflow, it leads to bronchodilation, which is better for asthmatic patients. So when you give ketamine in a patient like this who has constricted bronchi bronchioles and asthma, it's going to improve his asthma. Okay, so that's why it was a very good option here. So the objective of this question is that ketamine, um, it's NMDA receptor, uh, it has sympathomimetic activity, so it's good for patients that have cardiogenic shock and also good for patients with asthma, okay? So, oh, and very, oh, this is very important. Now, I'm going to tell you extremely important thing. Please focus. Don't skip this part. So, if you look at the first line, it says ketamine is an anesthetic and analgesic. That's extremely important because it has come multiple times in past exams. But why I'm telling you it's very important is for some reason, 15th batch in their midterm, uh, I think I think it's the 15th batch. I, I don't know if you're, I, if you're 15th, but look, the, the year before you, they answered the question as propofol. Now, propofol is the wrong answer. You will see that in a midterm of one of the exam, the batches, the previous batches, propofol is the wrong answer. It is ketamine that acts as both an anesthetic and analgesic. Understood? Great. Now, wh whoever did that question, please send it in the group and tell them that that's a wrong answer. Propofol is not the answer. They can even open the lecture and they'll figure it out themselves. 
So yeah, so let's let's see some unique properties. Like I told you, ketamine was unique for uh, being good in asthma. Let's see some other unique properties that people that doctors might ask questions on. Propofol has anti-emetic properties, so it decreases post-operative nausea and vomiting. So if you get a patient that has a history of nausea, vomiting, or he's scared to have nausea and vomiting or something, okay, propofol is a good um, anesthetic because it's going to decrease the risk of the patient having operative nausea and vomiting, okay? Number two, ketamine, like I said, anesthetic and analgesic. Number three, etomidate. Very important to know that it can cause low aldosterone and cortisol levels. Cortisol is a stress hormone we all need. I'm currently using it. We all need it, okay? If I didn't have it right now, I'd be on the floor passed out. What that means is that important. And since etomidate decreases cortisol levels, we do not want to use it for a long time, okay? Because it's going to lead to low cortisol, which is not good. So if a patient needs intubation for a long time, you do not want to use etomidate. Remember that. Great. Next question. Okay, so let's read the last line of the question. Which of the following is the most likely impact of mixing the latter medication with the anesthetic agent? So did you need to know the whole what the whole question was talking about? Not really. So someone said D, uh, C, sorry. That is the correct answer. Some Two people said C, amazing. So let's look at what the question is saying. In the end, it says local anesthesia is administered via uh, via lidocaine mixed with epinephrine lidocaine is anesthesia epinephrine is a sympath sympathomimetic why is epinephrine give given in this case let's see the answers a decreased pain incorrect because epinephrine is not anti-pain b increase anesthesia potency by decreasing ph that's incorrect because that's not how epinephrine works c prolonged duration of action now that makes sense. Why? Because epinephrine is a vasoconstrictor. So imagine, let me, let's say we have a tube. Okay, let's say my arm, like let's say this is a tube, okay? So you give me anesthetics here, okay? I want it to work only in this part, okay? If you give me the anesthetic here, there's blood flow. So the blood, the anesthetics just gonna go to my arm, to my, and the rest of my body, which I don't want. I just want it to stick here, right? So what we can do is this tube, we can, which is blood flow, the arteries and veins, we can make them smaller. When we make them smaller, vasoconstrict them, it's going to be slower. The blood flow is going to be slower backwards. And that's why it's good. It's going to keep the anesthetic there. Okay. That's the method of action of epinephrine. C. Why do why is epinephrine given? Okay. This has come previously as an exam question to slow systemic absorption. And if you slow systemic absorption, you're going to have less side effects of epinephrine and you're going to prolong um, local anesthesia, okay? Now look, it says here local anesthesia, anesthetics cause vasodilation. So when you give epinephrine, you're doing the opposite. You're causing vasoconstriction, okay? Great. Um, so yeah, so these effects decrease the side effects and increase the duration. Now let's move on to the next question. Oh, before I move on to the next question, so this is uh, an aesthetics comparison. It's extremely superly pharmacologically low yield. I mean, like this shouldn't be a medicine question. It should be like something in uh, college of pharma. But I don't know why uh, three years ago, oh, was it three years ago? Yeah, three years ago in my midterm, they gave us this question. They said uh, a doctor wants to do a surgery using a long, uh, 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 an anesthetic with a long duration of action. Which one of the following is the answer? And the answer is bupivacaine. So if you want to remember which anesthetic has the fastest onset of action, remember lignocaine. And the longest duration of action, it's bupivacaine and tetracaine. But I think we only got one of these two, okay? Now, I don't know if they repeated that question or not because of how loyal that is, but just hinting that out. Now, let's move on to the next question.
Okay, so let's look at the question. So which of the following mechanism most likely explains the patient's rapid recovery from anesthesia? So the patient was given, he had the injury, he had, and then he needed anesthetic. He was given propofol. Now, propofol, and he becomes clinically alert several minutes after. So what that means is that he was given propofol, it sedated him, and then its, its um, <clears throat> effect decreased and disappeared, okay? He was no longer under the effect of propofol. It was a rapid, uh, just gone. Now, why? Why was it just gone that fast? Okay, that's the question. So anyone know the answer? No one, no, no one answered. So the correct answer is E, tissue redistribution of the drug. So this is the slide from the lecture. Look at the plasma levels. As soon as you give it in the blood, they decrease rapidly. And at the same time, look at the vital organs. They're increasing. Why? Because the propofol is going to the other places in the vital organs, okay? So if you want to remember that what leads to the de decrease in the efficacy of an anesthetic, it's that the anesthetic is distributed over the rest of the body organs in the body, okay? Remember that. So if it's in the CNS, it's going to go out of the CNS in other places, and that's why its effect decreases. Great. Now let's go on to the next. Um, so yeah, so that's it for anesthetics. We have four lectures, so that's why I'm kind of going through them. Anyone have any questions? Remember propofol's method of action. I mean, sorry, how it's how it's um, metabolized, um, why epinephrine is used, uh, the the unique properties of some of the IV anesthetics. Okay. And yeah, and also remember, you know, malignant hyperthermia, it most commonly occurs with succinylcholine. If you don't want it to occur, you can give other medications. Uh, malign malignant hyperthermia, uh, the antidote is dantrolene. Okay, just remember those as well. It came in the, in the lecture. Okay, now sedative hypnotics. Let's go, let's move on. So this is like benzodiazepine, I think, yeah. Benzos and barbiturates, anxiolytics. Stuff like that. Here's the first question. So someone said, ask me the antidote for malignant hyperthermia. The antidote is dantrolene. I don't know if it's in the lecture, but that's very important in general, okay? So let's look at that question. The expected beneficial effect of this drug is by which of the following mechanisms? So we just need to know which drug was given. It was The patient was given lorazepam. Lorazepam is a benzodiazepine. Benzodiazepines usually end with PAM, you know, diazepam, lorazepam, clonazepam. It's an easy way to remember that, oh, this is a benzodiazepine. So the way benzodiazepines work is by increasing, if you remember, I said you want to make it negative, the action potential, you want to make the um, the amplitude negative, right, of the cell. So, um, oh, because this guy has seizures, okay, remember, he has uh, seizures, so he, uh, I think you're going to take seizures later. So lorazepam, someone answered C. Now that's very close. So I like the answer, but it's very close, but that's the incorrect answer, and you're going to see why. So benzodiazepines are similar to barbiturates, but they have different mechanisms of action. They both lead to a higher chloride, which is a negative um, anion, cation, whatever you call it, it's negative. The more chloride you have in the cell, the more negative is going to be and the less action potentials, which is good. But the way they do it is different. Benzodiazepines, they increase the frequency of opening of GABA-A receptors. What that means is that if there's a GABA-A receptor that opens five times in an hour, that's just an example. It's not like that, of course. If it opens five times in an hour, the benzodiazepine is going to make it open 10 times in an hour. The number of times it opens is going to increase. A way you can remember is that benzodiazepines increase the frequency. So benzodiazepine, 
frenzo diazepines. Okay, remember? Benzo, frenzo, frequency. That's a way you can remember. So it binds to GABA-A receptors in a different site, and it leads to the activation of these GABA-A receptors. Now, why is it not C? Increased duration? Because C is barbiturates. Barbiturates, if they make a receptor open for 20 seconds, uh, if there's a receptor that's open for 20 seconds, the barbiturate is going to make it open for 40 seconds. Okay, so barbiturate increases the duration. Barbiturate duration. Remember that, okay? Uh, so yeah, so that's the answer. Answer is B. Now let's go on to the third question, second question, whatever. Okay, so let's look at the question. It says, short-term treatment. Someone said D. Um, yes. Okay, so let's see the answer. So a 27-year-old woman comes uh, to the physician because of poor sleep. She has been gradually sleeping less because of difficulty at night. She has trouble maintaining sleep. And the patient asks for a sleeping aid, but does not want to feel drowsy in the morning. She does not want. She wants to sleep. She wants a sleeping aid, but she does not want to feel drowsy. What that means is that she wants a drug with a short. Uh, it it lasts for a short time. If you give her a drug at 10 p.m., and she needs to wake up at 7 6 p.m., and this drug has a long action, she's gonna wake up at 6 p.m. still feeling drowsy, but she does not want that. So you want to give something with a short. Um, uh, action. So let's look at this. This is the answer D. Triazolam, if you, I'll show you the slide from the lecture, it has uh, it's short acting. Okay, so it's just going to make you sleep. And then when you wake up, you're not going to feel the effects of triazolam anymore. The arrest are used, are used for different things. Fluorazepam is long term, so it's going to cause drowsiness. Medazolam is used for anesthesia and small procedures. Lorazepam, very important to remember, it's used for status epilepticus, which you're going to le learn later in the seizure uh, lecture. And baclofen for muscle spasticity. So this <clears throat> is a slide from your lecture. It says that sleep disorders, you can treat benzodiazepines in insomnia. But remember that which ones are the best to use. Triazolam is a short acting, so it's very good. Also lately, Zolpidem, Zolpidem has also been used um, so, but Zolpidem is not a benzodiazepine though. So yeah, so that's the idea behind this. Um, yep. Next question. Sorry. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. You can go back to the question. Okay, so let's read the question. Administration of which of the following drugs is most likely to reverse this patient's symptoms? So what that means is that a patient came with a certain drug overdose and what can you give to reverse the, the, um, the symptoms? So let's read the question. 53-year-old woman, difficulty walking, slurred speech, progressive drowsiness. This is kind of sounding like that opioid intoxication we had with the five-year-old kid in the beginning of this lecture, right? She has a history of insomnia. The fact that she has a history of insomnia, what's that trying to say? It's saying that she might be taking medications like benzodiazepines for insomnia as we just saw in the question before this, that benzodiazepines can be used in insomnia. She appears lethargic, her temperature normal, pulse normal, respirations are normal. So if the respirations are normal, and then her pupils are also normal, wait, 
how does she have normal aspirations and normal pupils, but she's almost comatose? That means it's not opioid intoxication because opioid intoxication would have led to meiosis. Remember, shrunken pupils. Here, it's normal. So when you have a patient that has uh, similar symptoms as opioid intoxication with normal vitals and pupils, it's most likely a benzodiazepine intoxication. Benzodiazepines lower just everything in your body, makes you go like difficulty walking, slurred speech. Okay, but the pupils are going to be normal. Okay, they're going to be normal. And what is the what's the antidote for benzodiazepine? It is not naloxone. Naloxone is antidote for what? Opioid intoxication. B, dantrolene, the antidote for what? Uh, malignant hyperthermia. D, diazepam is used for uh, status epilepticus. And flomazenil. How does flomazenil work? It's an antagonist at um, the uh, the GABA receptor. So, so here, fl flumazenil rapidly reverses only benzodiazepine effects. It's an antagonist at the GABA receptor. So that is the idea behind this. Remember how to differentiate between benzodiazepines and opioid intoxication. That's also a very important thing, okay? And now let's go on to migraine treatment. So does anyone have any questions for Um, oh, sedative hypnotics. Anyone have any questions for sedative hypnotics? Remember, um, the antidote, short acting versus long acting, and the differences in bet between the me mechanisms of actions of these two, the, the different types of drugs. Now, Dr. Dana Bakhit, her questions usually come from the green highlighted um, words and sentences. So Dana Bakhit's questions are usually straightforward. Make sure you at least focus on the green highlighted words and sentences from her lectures. Now let's go on to the last lecture, which is migraine treatment. So let's go on. Now, you know, let's, let's, let me tell you something about migraines. So migraine treatment, the main idea behind migraine treatments is knowing a few things. Number one, you want to know what is the abortive therapy for migraine treatment? MashaAllah, someone already answered. Do you have mnemonics for the drugs? Unfortunately, I do not have mnemonics. Uh, but I'll try to come up with some and I'll make sure to get back to you, you guys uh, through someone in your batch for mnemonics for these drugs uh, if I find them. Inshallah, I'll work on that. So uh, migraine... Uh, okay, migraine, you want to know something. You want to know the abortive therapies. What does that mean? It means when a person is having a migraine right now, what can you give them to stop the migraine right now? Okay, that's one. Which types of drugs? Number two, you want to know, okay, the patient is normal but has a history of migraines. What medication you can you give to make sure these migraines don't come back? Prophylactic therapy. So these are two biggest things. And then number three, you just want to know some common mechanisms of action, some contraindications, etc. And we'll see right now. Okay, so this is the first question. Okay, someone answered. They answered D. Um, D. No, oh, sorry, they answered D. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's the right answer. So let's see the question. Uh, Twenty-four. Uh, the, the which of the following was most likely given? The patient is prescribed an abortive therapy. They already just told you abortive, mashallah. The therapy that acts by inducing cerebral vasoconstriction. So that's easy, okay? But let's look at the whole question. A 24-year-old woman in graduate school comes to the physician for recurrent headaches. The headaches are unilateral, throbbing, and usually preceded by blurring of vision. The symptoms last between 12 and 48 hours. Now, why I want to go into this question in more in detail, because this is part of the migraine question as well in terms of neurology. Okay, it's, so I want to explain migraine a bit more in terms of neurology. So migraine, is, it's different from tension headaches in several ways. 
So you can ha you have three things that they usually want you to uh, differentiate from. You have tension headaches, you have cluster headaches, and then you have number three, which is migraines, okay? Tension headache. Tension headache is something we've all experienced. It's when, you, when you're when you just so stressed, you've been working so much, you've been having low little food, dehydrated, whatever, and then your head just hurts all over. It just hurts, hurts on both sides, everywhere. It's not just one side, it's both sides. Now that's a tension headache. It's easy. But migraine headaches are usually unilateral. So it's only going to affect the right or left side. There is usually a pre-aura phase, like an aura fa oral, aura phase. What is the aura? Aura is like symptoms that come before that headache and the pain. What, are, what can those symptoms be like? Blurring of vision. Okay? So blurring of vision is aura. That's a type of aura. Something else can be a change in smell or taste. Or they just see colors. You know, these are all aura. They're just hinting to you of migraine headaches. Look at the age of this patient. 24-year-old woman. It happens in these ages. It's more commonly occurs in women as well. And at this age. So this is all things that you want. I want you to know about migraines. And then cluster headaches. Cluster headaches. I don't know how important that is for you guys. Cluster headaches usually happen more in common in males. And they have more symptoms such as severe, abrupt eye pain they can have rhinorrhea okay that's more commonly as cluster headache eye pain eye tearing and the nose discharge okay now let's get back to our pharmacology this patient right now has migraine what can you treat this patient with you can treat this patient with abortive therapies what are the abortive chair therapies you can have specific and non-specific ones non-specifics are like NSAIDs, ibuprofen and acetaminophen Okay, just like a tension headache, you can get it. Specific ones are like triptans and ergotamines. These work by what? If you want to know how a drug works, you need to know the physiology, pathophysiology of the, um, the migraine itself. So migraines are theorized that they occur because of cerebral vasodilation. So when the, when the blood vessels vasodilate, let's say this is a nerve. Let's say this is my nerve. Okay, and this is... The blood vessel. So this is my blood vessel. Okay, it's normal. When it dilates and becomes bigger, it's going to comp compress and activate the nerve, the trigeminal nerve most commonly. When the nerve is activated, okay, that leads to the pain. So what that means is you don't want vasodilation. You want vasoconstriction. So which medications cause vasoconstriction? It's the um, triptans and ergotamines, which is the answer here. Okay. So it causes constriction of the cranial blood vessels and it's used for abortive therapy, not for prophylactic. Remember that. So next question. Here it's a similar scenario, but the patient is given prophylactic therapy. I Actually, it's the exact same scenario. I just changed prof abortive to prophylactic. So which one of the following is going to be prophylactic? So this is an easy one, C, yes, C is the right answer. Uh, remember from this slide, prophylactic, most of the first line is propanol, and then these are the other ones, which you're gonna be, you're, it looks hard, like all these names, by the way, let me just explain something to you. At first, when you look at a lecture, you're you're like, wow, this is, these are so many medications, this is so hard, um, you don't understand them over time, you start connecting all the dots over time when your knowledge increases with all in terms of the different uh, topics, like in terms of physiology, anatomy, pharmacology, you start connecting the dots. When you start connecting the dots, everything becomes much easzier. So don't stress too much inshallah any. That sounds it's easier to say than done. Okay, so this is the last question. So, yeah. Ugh. So this is a patient. 
with headaches, with uh, with migraine. He has migraines, she has migraines. And they're asking which of the following medications can be given for abortive therapy. Now, you're going to be thinking, Umar, you said all of the triptans can be used for abortive therapy. So why are four choices of triptans in the question? That's because she has depression and takes MAO inhibitors. This is something from the lecture. For some reason, MAO inhibitors have a drug interactions with most of the triptans, except for one, naratriptan. Naratriptan is the only medication from the triptans of these four triptans that does not have interactions with MAO inhibitors. <clears throat> now, MAO inhibitors, you're going to take them later in depression, is rarely used for depression these days. But to make a question, why not you, right? So this is the answer, neurotriptan. Why? Because it does not interact with MAO inhibitors. I'm not, so this came as a question, by, by the way, for us um, in our exam, yes. So so that's it for the, for what's this? Um, migraine treatment. Remember, like I said, abortive versus prophylactic. And then, um, yeah. So does anyone have any questions on migraine treatments before I give you two more extra questions? <clears throat> okay, let's go on. Um, okay, this is a good question. I want you guys to just focus on the last two last two sentences. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> this patient has cerebral palsy. <clears throat> Now, I don't know if you've taken cerebral palsy or not, yet or not. You're eventually going to take it. It's okay if you don't know what that means right now, but you need to at least you know the last two sentences. It says, an oral medication is prescribed that reduces extremity stiffness. And this is part of the lecture. And it's also, it was I also explained this in one of the questions I recently answered. So let me give it to you here. This is the question. This is the slide. Look at the last question, the last uh, sentences. Baclofen. In cases of muscle spasticity, which is similar to stiffness, which the patient had, you can give a muscle relaxant that is believed to affect the GABA B. So it's not GABA A like the other benzodiazepines. Okay, it's GABA B. You remember that? And so GABA B, you can give baclofen to, uh, which will lead to muscle relaxation. So now you might be thinking, Omar, this is such a hard question. Why did you bring it? I brought it because she highlighted it in green. So maybe she might ask this as a new question or something. Just remember, baclofen is used for muscle stiffness and spasticity and it acts differently such that it acts at the GABA B uh, receptor so she can give you a uh, she can give you a drug and say oh this drug was acting at GABA B and then you will be like okay that was that's GABA back baclofen okay now uh, um yeah this is another question this is uh, by the way I'm just giving random questions Okay, so you probably understand understood 0% of the, the question, which is completely normal. This is way clinical. But uh, the, what the doctor can do is, you know, simplify the clinical scenario in easier words and then ask you, etomidate is administered. So which is best describes etomidate as compared to propofol? Now that's something you can memorize and know. And the answer is uh, D, okay? Uh, oh no, I didn't put the, I didn't put it in the um, I didn't bring your slides. I forgot to. Sorry. So look, um, when a patient comes like after a, like trauma or something, they're gonna be losing a lot of blood, right? When they lose a lot of blood, they're gonna be hypotensive. When a patient's hypotensive, you don't want to furtherly cause their um cardiovascular system to become even more depressed, right? Because that can lead that can literally kill them. 
because their cardiovascular is already depressed and and they need more pumping of the blood because they're losing blood. So what you can give is an anesthetic that does not cause cardiovascular depressant effect, and that is etomidate, okay? Etomidate is better than propofol in terms of this, in terms of uh, D. Now, why is E wrong? Possible use for maintenance anesthesia. If you remember, I told you etomidate leads to lower cortisol and endosterone levels, so you should not use it for long-term anesthesia, okay? Uh, an analgesic effect, A, remember that's ketamine. And C is completely wrong because it's the opposite, okay? So that's it for my session. We're almost at one hour. Um, just, um, you will, I mean, most of the people are going to be you watching this video on YouTube anyways. So you can just pause it when I'm going too fast or you can make it 0 0.75. If I'm going too slow, you can make it 1.5, however you want to do it. Make sure you know how to use those settings as well. And last but not least, I just want to give you some tips. If you don't have any questions, if you have any questions, please do put them. Uh, but just some tips. Look, I've done uh, I've done a lot of questions in my life. Like I've finished step one, step two, and Saudi medical licensing exam. I'm not trying to flex, but I'm trying to give you my advice. I think the biggest thing that helped me succeed was doing a lot of questions. A lot, a lot, a lot of questions. Keep the notes and reading somewhere else okay the reading of course is good you want to read the, the lectures but highlighting and writing uh, so much notes i don't know how helpful that is actually the more uh, more helpful things are uh anki i mean because it's um timed repetition you know if you read that ketamine is an, an analgesic right now and then you read it again in two days and then in five days you know if you keep repeating that thing Timed repetition, it's going to stick in your mind. That's one way you can use Anki if you want to use it. But the most, I think, beneficial for me was questions. Questions, questions, questions. You want to do as many questions as you can. You want to use your external resources. For pathology, I'm sure there's like a pathology book. I forgot. I, forgot, I think it was called Robbins, Robinson or something like that. I use that. I use a lot of AMBOSS. I even used UWorld PDFs. Okay, I think that was given by the university. It's not too early to start it. Don't think you need to start those when you're in fourth and fifth year. The earlier you start, the easier third, fourth, and fifth year is going to be. Cut B. So you want to do all those questions. Um, any more weird questions that you remembered? Sorry, unfortunately, that's most of the weird questions I remember. So yeah, so like I said, do questions, 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 questions. That my big, that's my biggest advice for you. Not only now, but in all blocks in all board examinations and for the rest of your medical exams, okay? That's it. The following is a QR code you can scan to give me some feedback. I'd appreciate some feedback to help me improve my performance in the future and help other students uh, even better. Thank you very much. And if no one has any questions, then uh, goodbye. Assalamu alaikum.